Welcome to another exciting episode of uh, Sitcom Theology, where we're using classic television to help us get a better grasp of the message of Ephesians, to help us tune in to that message. Today, we're going to be taking a closer look and listen at Ephesians 6, chapter, uh, yeah, verses 1 through 4. Um, we heard that read just a few moments ago. Uh, if you want to open your Bibles and follow along or, you know, pull it up on your devices, go right ahead. Um, the big idea of this passage, uh, as you heard, was the relationship of children and parents in the Christian household. And of course, what more wholesome and appropriate classic TV show is there to talk about how parents and children should relate to each other than Leave it to Beaver? Okay, actually, you know, I kind of was torn between this and the Andy Griffith show, but I, I found what I thought was the perfect episode uh, for this message in Leave it to Beaver. Now, anyway, before we start to focus on the text, let's rewind to last week and remind ourselves of the context of these verses, because like we heard last time, a text without a context is just a pretext for a proof text, right? You always have to keep in mind the bigger picture with any passage of Scripture, or you'll end up making the Bible say things it never meant to say. We need to especially be careful about putting words in the Bible's mouth when it comes to intensely personal and crucial relationships like marriage and parenting. Last week, we learned that the context for Paul's instructions for Christian households goes all the way back to chapter 5, verse 18, right? Which is where Paul tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul says that one of the things that Spirit-filled believers and Spirit-filled churches do is, in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul's household instructions, his household code here that we're, we're looking at, was an extension of how spirit-filled believers relate to one another. And what he's saying is, okay, here's how you apply this submit to one another thing in your family life. He's saying in the spirit-filled household, you serve the Lord by serving each other. And the verses that we're focusing on today specifically describe spirit-filled relationships between children and parents. Basically, what we're going to look at is what it means for parents and children to submit to one another in Christ. And yes, I just said that. Parents and children to what? Submit to one another. Because that's the verse that is over all of this. So Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 1, let's start looking at how, how the Holy Spirit wants children and parents to submit to each other. Ephesians 6, verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Something I want to point out about uh, what Paul's doing here, we talked about last week how Paul's doing a household code, which was just a very common thing back then. It was, you know, they would say, this is how you run your household. Well, back then, it was pretty much just all... Okay, dads, you're large and in charge. These are your privileges. These are your powers. Oh, and by the way, mom and kids and servants, you, you have to do everything to make dad happy. So Paul's household code is radically different in a lot of ways. And one of those is that, you know, back then, women, children, servants, right? They're basically second-class citizens, right? Every time Paul addresses the person who socially would have been weaker, first. That's a big deal because he's saying, hey, I see you. You matter. Your contribution to the family matters beyond just keeping dad happy. That's huge. So 
This word that he uses here for children, it's, in Greek it's technon, and it doesn't just mean a little child, it's the general word for the offspring of a mother and a father. So that included adult children. Paul is probably specifically thinking here maybe about um, children who still li live at home with their parents, even if they're adults. So Paul's basically saying, look, even if you're 25 years old, if you're still living with your parents, rent-free, they're helping you pay any of your bills, guess what? You owe it to them to live their way as long as you're under their roof. You know, in verses 21 and 22, I'm going to go back once again to, to last week, Paul told wives to what? Submit to their husbands. And in that context, submit refers to someone who's an equal who voluntarily defers to someone else's wishes. Paul uses a different word here, right? He says here, obey. He didn't tell wives to obey their husbands, but he did tell children to obey their parents. Now, one of the things that we can draw from that to just kind of go back and, and do a little cleanup from last week is that this means, right, if wives submit to their husbands, and that's a word about an equal voluntarily deferring, but the child obeys both parents, that means that husband and wives, according to Scripture, are what? They are equal partners in the home, and they both have equal authority over their children. You get that from the language here. Now, notice that Paul does put an important qualifier, um, an asterisk, on the children's obedience. And that is, children obey their parents, what? In the Lord. Now, there's a few ways that you could take this phrase, and they may not be exclusive. Like, it could be in all of the above. In the Lord could mean something like, it is your Christian duty to obey your parents. That's how the Good News translation has it. You could also look back at Christ's example as Lord, right? Um, Luke uh, chapter 2 verse 51 tells us that Jesus was obedient to his parents. So the idea of obeying your parents in the Lord could be about following Christ's example, right? Like if even Christ, right, who is God in the flesh, obeyed his earthly parents, you should too. That's one way of looking at it. I kind of lean toward a third option, even though I'm kind of open to all of the above. But I think there's one option that guides all the other ones. And that is, if you read Paul, you'll notice that he regularly, almost constantly uses phrases like in Christ or in the Lord to describe right, our relationship as believers with Christ. Right? So if you are a Christian, you are in Christ. You are in the Lord. So here's what I think. I think Paul is talking to children whose parents are already believers. Remember last week I said that everything that Paul's talking about in these verses, he's assuming that everyone in the household is a spirit-filled believer, right? And they're seeking to please Christ. There are other things that Paul wrote and other things that are in the scriptures that will address what happens if someone in the household is not a believer or someone in the household is being abusive or, you know, dad's abandoning the family, that kind of thing. That scripture deals with that elsewhere. This is Paul's kind of like, this is what a household should look like if everyone in the household is a Christian because he sees the household almost like as a little extension of the church. So I think Paul's talking to children whose parents are also believers and he's saying something like this and we can incorporate all the possible meanings of in the Lord. He's saying, you know, your parents are also Christians just like you and they also have the Holy Spirit in them. So as long as they are not asking you to do something that's sinful or harmful, the Lord wants you to obey them. By the way, just like he obeyed his parents. I mean, now there are obviously exceptions, right? Um, like if they're trying to get you to go along with something sinful. Like if, if mom says, um, you know, help me shoplift these purses, right? Or... Um, you catch dad cheating on mom, and he says, don't tell mom, <laughs> right? In those situations, you wouldn't be obeying your parents in the Lord, right, if you went along with what they said. You'd be obeying your parents against 
the Lord. There's one more exception that I can think of, and that is if what they are doing is harmful to you. And let me give you an example. And this is kind of a softball example. I know a family where the parents are, they're, they're kind of a wealthy family, they're kind of a socialite family, and the parents are very much, they keep a very busy social calendar, right? So their kids are, they were like constantly over scheduled. And so after the 15th weekend in a row of mom and dad saying, okay, we're going to go visit so-and-so and so-and-so and do this and do that this weekend, the kids kind of revolted respectfully, but they're like, no, no more of this. We, we need time to rest. Please quit dragging us around everywhere every weekend, okay? What those kids were doing in that situation was they were expressing, look, we have a legitimate need to rest and to be together as a family. And so mom and dad, we kind of need to put our foot down here. I think that's also kind of a legitimate example. There are other things like that that happen, but once again, that's kind of working together as a family to say, okay, enough of this, we need to address this, this issue. So here's the deal. If you look at this big picture, Obeying your parents in the Lord indicates that there is a relationship of what? Of trust between the children and the parents. Even in the example I just gave you of the overscheduled kids who are like, we, we got to quit going out every weekend. They weren't being rebellious, right? It's just that they could not go along with what their parents wanted anymore. And so they explained why. So there's this relationship of trust that is assumed in obey your parents in the Lord. Sometimes, however, and if you're a parent or if you're a kid who's a bit more grown up or even if you're a teenager right now, you know this. Sometimes that relationship gets tested. It gets pulled. It gets strained. And that is what happens in our sitcom for today, Leave it to Beaver. Leave it to Beaver focused, of course, on the all-American Cleaver family, parents Ward and June and their sons, Wally and little brother, Theodore Beaver Cleaver. Now, Ward and June on the show are gentle but authoritative parents. Wally and Beaver are often portrayed as wide-eyed innocents, often stumbling and fumbling as they try to navigate their way through life. Now, every once in a while, Beaver and Wally's friends, like Eddie Haskell and Larry Mondello, will entice them to disobey their parents' wishes. Um, but more often than not, it's the brothers who get themselves into trouble because they want to take matters into their own hands. Be looking for that, wanting to take matters into their own hands, as we watch the opening moments of our episode for today. Hey, Beaver, they're calling you. I don't think I hear them. <laughs> Beaver! Now I think I gotta hear them. <laughs> now look, Beaver, whatever you did, don't drag me into it. Now look, Beaver, I know what you told Miss Canfield, but just between us men, why didn't she go to the cafeteria for lunch? Just between us men? Uh-huh. I wasn't hungry. Uh, Beaver, you, you know, you kind of hurt my feelings. I, uh, I thought you liked your old dad well enough to not have any secrets from him. Now, come on, why didn't you have your lunch? If I tell you, you'll be mad at me. That's ridiculous. Now, come on, tell me. I lost to my money. Again? <laughs> oh, Beaver. Your mother and I have been very patient with you, but this habit of losing money has got to stop. I told you you'd be mad at me. I'm not mad at you. <laughs> okay, shake. <laughs> okay, Beaver. But we've got to do something about this business of losing money. Couldn't have another chance. I don't mean to lost in anything. <laughs> Okay, so the backstory is Beaver has lost his lunch money three days in a row. And, um, you know, even watching this, you can see some of the warning signs of trouble ahead right from the beginning. 
One is, did he, what did Wally say? Whatever you've done, don't drag me into it. Which means inevitably what's going to happen? Wally's while going to get dragged into it. But the, the big warning signs for trouble ahead that you see is that first, when Beaver is afraid or ashamed, he is prone to do what? Yep, I said fudging the truth a little bit, but yeah, lie. And here's the thing, that is not uncommon in children. It's also not uncommon with grown-ups. When we are afraid, when we are ashamed, what do we often do? We minimize, we cover up. That's so human, and I think I love people more for it in a weird way. Um, human beings in the act of being human, we all do it. Second, Ward told Beaver he would not be angry with him if he told him the truth, right? But then what did Ward do? He got angry. This means that the next time that Beaver is struggling with something or he gets into trouble, is he going to trust his father? He's going to have a hard time with that. Now the next day, Ward decides to give Beaver another chance. Beaver is supposed to be playing an angel in the school play, and Ward does not want his son looking shaggy on stage. So he sends him to the barber with money for haircut and, of course, strict instructions not to lose it this time. But when Beaver gets to the barber shop, lo and behold, he discovers a hole in his shirt pocket that his money has slipped through. He's lost it again. And that's where the adventure of this episode of Leave it to Beaver really begins. But for now, let's tune back into our text just for a little bit. In verse 2 of Ephesians 6, Paul says that it's not enough to just obey your parents. He says that's a good starting point. But he also quotes Deuteronomy 5 verse 16, which is one of the Ten Commandments. He says to honor your father and your mother. Obedience means, here's the difference between obedience and honor here. Obedience means that you submit to the choices your parents make for you. But honoring your parents, that takes more work because that has to do with the choices that you make. It means, for one thing, just like within the relationship, the family relationship, that your parents know that you love them and you value them and you respect them from the way that you treat them. But honoring your parents also has to do with the choices that you make when you go out into the world and you're living your life. It means living in such a way that your parents are delighted to tell everyone, hey, that's our son hey, that's our daughter, and we are so proud of them. So honoring your parents has to do with the choices that you make when you're out in the world um, living. And it's this idea, honoring our parents, that I think Paul is really trying to bring home and emphasize. See, here's the deal. You can obey your parents without honoring them. Right? Like you can do what your parents said, but you're angry about it, you're bitter, you're grumbling, you're griping, and as soon as you move out of the house, you're not going to do that anymore, right? So you can obey your parents without honoring them. We'll come back to that in a little bit on the flip side. But in the spirit filled family, Paul ultimately says that children honor their parents. That's how, as children, you submit to your parents out of reverence for Christ. Now, honor requires more, like I said, than just obedience. For example, I know a lot of you here have lived long enough and your parents have lived long enough that you've had to care for your elderly parents. I've seen some of you here do amazing, heroic, sweet, beautiful jobs of caring for your parents in their elderly years. Well, here's the thing. When you're, a lot of times when you're, you know, you're in your 50s and 60s and your parents are in their 90s, the roles now are reversing, right? Like you're kind of having to parent them. They're needing to step back, submit to you, obey you. And if you were to obey everything that your parents told you to do, especially when it comes to their own care, you probably wouldn't be honoring them, would you? Because you'd be like 
things would be left sliding, like doctor's appointments and living arrangements and things like that, right? So honoring your parents, you have to put a lot more thought and intentionality into that than just obeying. All right, so now let's switch the channel back to leave it to Beaver. We left Beaver at the barber shop panicking because he's lost his haircut money. What choice could Beaver make that would honor his father? As, as adults, we know the simple answer. You go home and you say, Dad, I'm sorry, I lost my haircut money, but this time it's not my fault. It fell through this hole in my pocket. Most of us would probably do that, right? But when kids expect punishment, it makes them afraid. And at any age, at any age, when we make decisions based on panic or fear or shame, they will probably not be wise decisions. So let's see what Beaver does. Wally, you see my scissors? No, Mom. Oh, well, they'll turn up. Beaver, are you in there? I am here, Wally. Well, what are you doing? I'm not doing nothing. Nothing at all, Wally. Beaver, you come on out of there. If you don't, I'm going to tell Dad. All right. What's that? A haircut, I think. Wow. You look like Wilson's Airedale when he had the mange. Why don't you let Stanley cut your hair? Stanley wasn't there. Anyways, I lost my money. What a goof. How could you lose the money again? I don't know. Wait till Dad gets a load of that head. <laughs> Wally, couldn't you fix it up for me? Don't be crazy. I can't give anybody a haircut. Did you ever give anybody one? No. Then how do you know? <laughs> It's a real small head. Well, I guess I could make it look a little bit better than it does now. Sure you could. Okay, hand them over. You're a wonderful brother. I think that's about it. Are you finished? I don't know, but I think I'd better stop. <laughs> I've never seen one like it, have you? different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How long do you think before it grows back? At least a week. Well, I can't hide for a whole week. <laughs> no. I'm sorry, Beef. Oh, that's okay. It's only the first haircut. You'll get better as you go along. So yeah, well, Beaver went and drug Wally into this mess after all, and that night, both of them came down to dinner with their heads covered by long winter caps. They even had a cover story for their cover-up. 
They told their parents that they have to wear these hats nonstop for two whole weeks as part of an initiation ritual into a secret club. But of course, Ward and June are naturally suspicious that the hats the boys are wearing have something to do with that haircut that Beaver was supposed to get. So that night after Beaver and Wally have gone to sleep, they sneak up to their rooms and they lift the caps. And of course, that's when they discover the fuzzy mohawk that Beaver has given his brother, or Wally has given his brother. But that, that haircut is not the worst of it, is it? The haircut is they've now confirmed that both of their children have lied to them. Beaver and Wally have not only not obeyed their parents, they've, they've not honored them. So the next morning, Warden June go to confront Beaver and Wally about the haircut. Morning, boys. Boys, I want to talk to you. Now, Beaver, yesterday I gave you a dollar and 75 cents to get a haircut. Is that right? Yes, sir. Did you get a haircut? I sure did. At the barber shop? I went to the barber shop. Did you get a haircut there? I got a haircut, all right. <clears throat> Beaver, did you get a haircut at the barber shop? I went to the barber shop and I got a haircut. Beaver, take off that cap. I can't. It's the initiation for the secret club. Wally. There is no secret club. Please remove that cap. <laughs> All right, Beaver. Is this the haircut the barber gave you at the barber shop yesterday? No, sir. Did you give yourself this haircut? Excuse me. <clears throat> I said, did you give yourself this haircut? Not exactly. Wally, what do you know about this haircut? Um, well, I think it'll grow back in a week. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm very sorry, boys, but this time I'm really going to have to punish you. Beaver, it would have been very easy for me to forgive you if you had just stood up and said, Dad, I lost my money and Wally gave me the haircut. Dad, I lost the money and Wally gave me the haircut. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, but it's too late for that now. You better both go up to your room and wait there while your mother and I decide what to do about this. just cannot understand it. I have tried so hard to win their confidence to prove to them that I'm on their side. Why should they lie to me? Certainly it isn't my fault. It certainly is. No man has ever tried harder to be a buddy to... to... <laughs> what did you say? It certainly is your fault and mine. Why, don't you realize what a spot we put him on? Oh, that's ridiculous. Put yourself in his place. He loses his lunch money three days in a row. And then after being warned that this is his last chance, he loses his haircut money. Naturally, he's afraid to tell us. What's so natural about it? Are we monsters? Do we hit them? Do we beat them? Warned. The only guy the little fellow has is the love and approval of his parents. Now, if he thinks he's lost, that is worse than a beating. Well, I don't know. Look. He was afraid to tell us the truth, wasn't he? Yeah. Who's frightening him if it isn't you and me? I guess that's one of the troubles with being a parent. You love your kids so much, you scare the pants off of them. Sometimes you love some of your kids so much, you scare the pants off of them. That's what Ward told June. What does our passage today tell us? 
Basically, it tells us that in the spirit-filled household, it's not just the children who submit by obeying and honoring their parents. Remember, in these verses, submission means serving each other, yielding to one another, deferring to one another, putting their needs before our own. Our passage today also teaches parents how to submit to their children. Let's listen to Ephesians 6, verse 4. First it says, Fathers. Now your Bibles might have a footnote here that says parents, because these instructions really apply uh, equally to either parent or both parents. But fathers or parents, do not exasperate your children. What does it mean to exasperate your children? Other versions say don't provoke them to anger. The message clarifies by saying don't exasperate them by coming down too hard on them. There's also a parallel verse, Colossians 3 verse 21, where Paul says not to discourage your children or not to crush their spirits. Paul's basically telling you not to set unrealistic expectations for your kids and then come down on them when they don't live up to those expectations. He's also saying... Don't make them so afraid or resentful of you that they won't turn to you when they're struggling or hurting because they don't trust you. Here's the short version. Paul is telling us and telling, you know, his parents, don't set your children up to fail. That's what June basically told Ward that they'd done with Beaver, that they'd set him up to fail, that they'd made him afraid to come to them when he was in trouble. Uh, One of the things I love about this too is we also see Ward submitting to his wife, right? He's listening to her wisdom and he's persuaded to go a bit of a different direction. Now, you know, up to a certain age, you can bully and intimidate and scare your children into obedience, but it comes at an awful cost. Because you're either going to totally crush their spirit or you're going to make them come to resent you. And they will never feel safe to share anything they're struggling with with you. They're not going to want a relationship with you. They're not going to change your diapers when you get old. Or at least make sure that someone is changing you somewhere nice. They might obey you for a while, but they are not going to honor you. If you want your children to grow up and honor you, Paul says you start by not exasperating them. Don't wear them down. Don't wear them out. Don't provoke resentment and bitterness in them. Don't crush their spirits by being harsh with them. Instead, Paul says, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. The word that's translated for bring up here in this text, it is a word for raising children, but it has a a deeper meaning. It means to feed, to nourish, to care for. A great way to get this meaning across would be to say, nurture your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Nurturing your child, right? That's a different image. It means that you're pouring yourself into bringing up your child. You're investing your time and your attention and your energy into their growing lives. It also says, right, that you are nurturing them in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let's talk about what that phrase means. Nurturing your children in the training and instruction of the Lord doesn't just mean that you make sure they go to church. It's not even making sure that you go to church with them. It's not bringing them to Sunday school or to youth group. It's not sending them to Bible camp. It's not making sure they know all the right Bible verses. It's not even about having family worship at home where you pray and read the Bible and talk about spiritual matters as a family. Now, don't get me wrong and don't hear me wrong. Parents should absolutely be making sure their children are learning the specifics of our faith. And all of those ways that I mentioned are great ways to be doing that. But the way that it's worded in the original language, the training and instruction of the Lord is not talking about what we might call religious education, okay? 
It doesn't mean that you teach your children all the right things about Jesus. Instead, it means the Lord's training and instruction. The New Living Translation gets this point across really well. It says to bring up your children with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Right? It's the Lord's training and the Lord's instruction. In other words, parents, and I'm one of those now, so I'm talking to me. The Lord is training and instructing your children through you as you pour into them and invest in them. When spirit-filled parents nurture their children, Christ is nurturing them through you. Because through the Spirit, Christ is present in your life and in your home. And Christ is discipling your child for life and work in His kingdom as you disciple them in your Spirit-filled home. You know, as I was preparing for this message and watching that episode of Leave it to Beaver, I got to thinking, you know, for a lot of people now... Leave it to Beaver is kind of a joke, right? Um, we laugh at this intact 1950s family that's got two parents and the dad's always buttoned down with pressed pants and mom's always wearing pearls while doing the dishes. And we kind of laugh like, oh, that's the corny 1950s family. Or we say, well, you know, nobody's family was ever really like that. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough, nobody's family was really ever like that. But we see so many broken and dysfunctional households now, right? Like, do we really dare to laugh at the Cleavers? At least Ward and June were able to make their home a haven in a heartless world. It's the popular of a, title of a popular book from a few decades ago put it. You know, God designed families to be places of love and shelter and peace and new energy. But so many people experience the family as oppression and abuse and fear and bondage. But Christ, Christ came to redeem and renew all the good things that God has created, including our families. So he places our spirit-filled families in the world as little outposts of the church. So that even people from broken or dysfunctional or abusive households can see that families can also be places where children honor their parents and parents nurture their children. And when they see parents and they see children submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, then our households glorify God. Because maybe people who need a family will catch a glimpse of our Heavenly Father in our Spirit-filled houses, and they'll find a home in Christ's love, and they'll find a family in His church. 